let's start. The topic for today is virtual currency. And uh, I hope that we will also have time to do in-game currencies because we only have two weeks left. And next time uh, we will talk about parallel systems, parallel monetary systems, where you have more currencies operating at this, in the same monetary area at the same time. <clears throat> Let's start with the listening task that you had about cows. First question, what is the major problem in South Sudan? Um, there's currently a civil war there. Yes, the, the, <clears throat> the war is the basically, mm -hmm, the war, yes. The war is basically over, but many people have been displaced and they still don't really have peace. So it's a situation after the war. How many cows did the guy interviewed in the podcast pay as a dowry? Um, 85, I believe. Yes, it was 85. And uh, in the West, it would be like $15,000. So he paid that much money in order to get rid of his daughter. What is the crucial difference between cows and other currencies? Um, it's easy to tell which cows are yours because you can put different markings on them. Interesting. I never thought about it, but yes, that makes sense. Um, I really liked what they said about the blood, because they also, instead of killing the cow, they use just the blood. And he said it's kind of like living off the, or using the interest on your savings. Because you can have the milk. Yeah, you can have the milk and the blood. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, so the cows... They're physical objects and they have non-monetary uh, utilities. They can die. Uh, that's also quite sad. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they have babies. They can reproduce. So that's the way new units of money are created. Mm. One of the original functions of money is workout. What does it mean? We have this one lecture on functions of money and I talked about workout too. Any idea? Um, is that the money they pay to uh, stop the war? Uh, I'm sorry, the broadcast really isn't good. Could you repeat it? The money that they pay? Um, is that the money that they pay to as a reconciliation? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's it's a penalty that you pay um, for a crime or as an excuse. Uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. What is the substance of cows? It can either be physical or consensual or protocol. So which one would it would this be? Physical. Yes, obviously. Um, what's the creation? Birth. Perfect. Yes. Or you can the natural or having babies, anything like that. Mm -hmm. What are the institutions? I would say something like customary law, traditions. And also, yeah, it, it can be farmers, dairy factories, um, this more profane uh, things as well, yes. Okay. What is a virtual currency? People sometimes mistake virtual currency for cryptocurrencies. Uh, the terminology is not super um, fixed. So <clears throat> it is a little bit fluid, but uh, there is a difference. According to ECB, uh, quotations from 2012, a virtual currency is a type of unregulated digital money that is important, which is issued and usually controlled by its developers. That is the major difference between a virtual currency and a cryptocurrency because a cryptocurrency is decentralized. It is not controlled by anyone, neither by the developers, and used and uh, accepted among the members of a specific virtual community. That is also important. Digital money controlled by its developers inside a virtual community. <clears throat> FinCEN, the American regulator, Virtual currency is a medium of exchange that operates like a currency in some environments, again, in a virtual community, but does not have all the attributes of real currency. In particular, virtual currencies does not have the legal tender status. 
in any jurisdiction. So it's a, let's say, a negative definition. It is not the legal tender. It is not accepted by the government or it's not promoted by the government. You don't have to accept it, unlike the legal tender. You only use it when you want to. Uh, European Banking Authority, the European regulator, virtual currency is a digital representation of value, again, that is neither issued by a central bank or a public authority. Again, a negative definition. This is a, a diagram, a scheme of digital currencies. It's like a tree which has at least four branches. Electronic money is fiat. It's like PayPal or uh, current accounts at, at your bank. That, that is electronic money. Electronic money is euro, dollar, check crown in a, in a digital form. Then you have in-game currencies, which are closed. That means that uh, they are not convertible. You can buy in-game currencies. Um, <clears throat> either you earn it while playing the game, or you can buy it with your fiat currencies, but you cannot uh, do the opposite. You cannot sell uh, your in-game currency and buy uh, your fiat back. So a typical example of an in-game currency would be monopoly money, and most of the types of currencies used in computer games too. You understand cryptocurrency and virtual currency is something in between. It's something like the in-game currency, but uh, that is the uh, both sides convertibility. So you can exchange virtual currency for the US dollar, for instance. This is a matrix produced by the European Central Bank. Um, it's like a taxonomy of types of currencies and they divide it uh, according to their legal status and money format. So there are regulated currencies, physical um, types of these are banknotes and coins, cash, or digital currencies like electronic money or deposits in the commercial banks, which are something very similar to e-money. We can say that uh, this is also electronic money. Uh, and then there are unregulated currencies, some of them are centralized, like the vouchers, the coupons, and local currencies. We spoke about them last time. Uh, then they are centralized digital currencies, which are not based on cryptography. So it can be uh, the electronic vouchers, we also spoke about them last time, or centralized virtual currencies. And this is our topic for today. And then there are decentralized, uh, types of money, like the cows, they are physical, it's commodity money, and digital decentralized currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies, and some types of cryptocurrencies that are not based on blockchain, because Ripple and Stellar Lumens use a different type of DLT. DLT is distributed ledger technology. They don't use the blockchain, but something quite similar. It is also a decentralized currency. And to some extent, it even is based on cryptography, not in the same way like Bitcoin, but um, yes, they are. So according to some people, Ripple or Stella would not really be cryptocurrencies, neither IOTA or HOLO or these um, interesting types of, of currencies uh, that don't use the blockchain as Bitcoin does. And it's quite interesting that European, that even the European Central Bank distinguishes between these two. And it's not just a scholar discussion among crypto geeks. Virtual currencies were invited or described in an academic paper by David Schaum, a famous cryptographer uh, in the 1980s. And uh, it was patented by Max Kaiser in the early uh, 90s. Uh, do you know this guy, Max Geiser? What is he famous for? He's hosting a show on RT, uh, RT.com. That's the that's the Russian uh, telly, and it's quite a good show. Uh, Max Geiser is something like the the Jordan Belfort from Wolf of Wall Street. He is an ex uh, Wall Street 
broker uh, or speculator. And then uh, in the 90s, he found his, uh, let's say, uh, his conscience and uh, changed the sides. So he started criticizing the malicious practices happening in uh, Wall Street. And uh, he's inviting interesting guests to his show that are you know, the, the, the criticize the contemporary financial and monetary system, which is to, to a large extent based on fraud, according to them and Max Kaiser. And also he's a famous promoter of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. He's been active in the cryptocurrency community uh, ever since it started. <coughs> Also, Max Kaiser invented the Hollywood dollar. Hollywood dollar was the first fully convertible virtual currency. So he could have exchanged Hollywood dollar to the US dollar and vice versa. It was a currency used in a computer game, Hollywood Stock Exchange. It is a multiplayer game, something like fantasy football. In the game, uh, you can buy shares of actors, directors, upcoming films, and film-related um, options. What does it mean? Uh, it is a prediction market. Does anyone have an idea what a prediction market is? In terms of cryptocurrencies, we already discussed that in terms of auger, I believe, or waves. So are you familiar with the idea of prediction markets? Uh, you look what the crowd is going to think and then you can use this output for your speculations. Beautiful, yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. People are betting with the real money on the outcomes of future events. And when they are right, they will win money. When they uh, are wrong, they will lose money. So they are very honest in their voting. So it's like a better version of a survey or, or of a questionnaire and because of the wisdom of the crowd you can uh, predict the future based on the shared wisdom or shared ideas of the majority of the people to some extent it works in this case you are speculating on the actors that will be successful on the movies that will be commercially successful and uh, that's it so uh, Based on this game, you could have predicted uh, success of, let's say, movies that are going to get to the, uh, to the movie theaters. Uh -huh. Voucher-based virtual currencies, um, incentive programs, loyalty programs, it's just the same thing like normal vouchers. <clears throat> By the way, the first coupons were in the late... Uh, 1880s <clears throat> for Coca-Cola mm, and then of course uh, they got digitalized so this is my former e-shop before I started uh, doing cryptocurrencies as a business I uh, used to sell women lingerie uh, bras underwear uh, swimming suits and and this stuff and uh, we used to reward our customers with loyalty points, um, <clears throat> which was our own virtual currency, because it was interchangeable for Czech crown, and it uh, used to serve as a discount for our products. What's the point? Why would a shop give something? So, give, why would a shop give money to their customers uh, that they can use for um, buying stuff? Every time somebody made a purchase, we gave them 10% back. To promote our products, uh, could you be more specific? You buy client, yes. You already have the client because they made a purchase, but yes, you, uh, you want them to engage more, to, to win their loyalty, as Pauli says. That's why they call it loyalty points. You want them to return. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, it has positive tax effects because you account for it as if it was uh, a discount so uh, it's and, and it's way better than to give real money 
uh, like check crowns to the customers <clears throat> because you have to earn them fast. It shows that product is cheaper and someone can buy it. The good thing about um, loyalty points is that you do not have to make the actual discount. You don't have to go down with the price, even though you are selling it cheaper. In fact, uh, on the eShop, there is the real price and you, you don't have to promote the discount for everyone. The price is a communication tool. So uh, if you try to sell luxurious, um, lingerie there must be quite a higher price tag on it because otherwise people would not believe that it is luxurious so you are trying to uh, target even the lower income groups but you need to use alternative tools like loyalty points of course our shop was not the only one doing this it's not such an original idea uh, other stores like amazon did the same. Uh, Amazon restrained from uh, that strategy later. I don't really know why. Uh, perhaps they found it was not that successful. Virtual currencies are general. Most in general, most of them are not super successful. Yet mm, it it can help and it can work uh, somehow. Some of the virtual currencies were. Um, created and promoted by business associations like these. Uh, it's from the 90s, as you can recognize, because there is the actress Whoopi Goldberg promoting uh, cafeteria systems uh, or floozy or beans. I don't remember which uh, one of them. Um, is this still operational? Are you familiar with beans, floozy or cafeteria systems currencies? I guess it only was used in the United States, uh, so I, I don't really know that. Um, marketplace currencies. This is relevant, I believe. Uh, this makes sense and there's huge potential in marketplace currencies. Imagine you are running a marketplace like eBay. What is your business? What's the point of your business or how would you describe it? What, what, what is that what you do? Connecting buyers and sellers, exactly. You're providing them with a platform so that they can meet. You do not have to uh, produce anything. You just take a fee uh, from whatever is sold through your platform. Now imagine that you produce your own currency that people can use uh, for buying things on the platform. <clears throat> of course, the sellers don't have to accept it, but if they do, uh, they make a discount on that fees or something. So you can promote your own currency um, like this so that it gets popular and it might be the first currency of choice at your marketplace. Uh, similarly, in cryptocurrencies, uh, big exchanges like OX or Binance do that. They have their own currency, which people use. They prefer it um, <clears throat> as a vehicle currency or a, as a clearing unit uh, because it makes the trading cheaper. When you use BNB at Binance, your fees are cheaper. So uh, that's why there is a lot of liquidity and there is demand for that coin. And any marketplace can do the same, not just a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, the Czech version of eBay Outcrop used, used to do the same. And the point here is that as long as there is demand for the currency, you are like the mythical king Midas. You heard about Midas touch, right? It, uh, the, the king had a wish that he wanted everything he touched to turn to gold. And it happened. In the end, it meant that he died starving because when he touched food, it turned into gold, which is like uh, <laughs> uh, bad. But uh, th the point here is that you are creating value out of nothing. As long as there is demand for your currency because it is useful, you don't have to produce anything. And it might be a really great business strategy. 
There are also virtual currencies that were developed as a currency, as, let's say, an alternative to the inflationary um, fiat currencies that are controlled by the central bank. Unlike Bitcoin, these projects were centralized. E-gold was the first example of a successful virtual currency, and it was the first one that was usable for uh, micropayments. In the 90s, micropayments were not really possible because the uh, you had to make an interbank payment, which is quite costly, so it doesn't pay off. Uh, to make a transaction for a couple of cents when you have to pay a dollar or half a dollar as a fee. Interestingly, the same thing happens to Ethereum today. Uh, you want to use Ethereum as a virtual machine in uh, blockchain-based computer games, or maybe you can use it for you. You want to use it for uh, micropayments, but the fees in Ethereum in their gas are quite expensive. It can be like 40, 50 American cents, which is expensive when you want to send just a couple of cents or buy a very small digital uh, or very cheap digital asset in, in a game. <clears throat> so, e-gold was based or backed by real gold, at least initially. Uh, then, they wanted to produce more e-gold than gold, so it was something like a fractional reserve system. They got a little bit corrupted, uh, but still it was successful. It was the first virtual currency with API. Does anyone know what API is? API is Application Programming Interface. It's a bridge between two programs. So one of the program is the database with the e-gold, and the other one would be your e-shop. So you just download the API and you connect the whole eGold ecosystem to your eShop so that it is compatible and the users can pay with the eGold at your eShop. That was the point. They want it to be real currency that is used by, um, by anyone. And it was the first successful uh, virtual currency or successful micropayment system because it had over 1 million users. How did it end? As is said here, it was closed uh, based on the Patriot Act. So according to the American authorities, producing a currency was an act of terrorism, an attack or assault against the domestic currency, uh, the dominant currency, the US dollar. Let's compare e-gold with the actual gold. E-gold substance is partial physical because there is a collateral, but due to the fractional resource, it is only um, partially backed with gold. The Monetary Authority was a so-called Gold and Silver Reserve Incorporated, which was an entity uh, that could have produced new units of e-gold. The interesting thing here is the monetary unit because uh, the monetary unit was a gram of gold. Unlike most of the other virtual currencies, it was not uh, packed to the US dollar. So the value of the eagle fluctuated with the value of gold. As a carrier, they used an electronic account and the transmission system is the API. Institutions. Next to the Golden Reserve, uh, Silver Reserve Incorporated, there also was an OmniPay system, an entity that uh, managed exchanges or ran exchanges, and there was an eGold Special Purpose Trust, which was a vault, and in the vault there was the collateral, the bullion, the gold. Creation is either by debasing the bullion, which is increasing the reserve, uh, the, the, the fractional reserve system, let's say, or uh, it would be also depositing more gold into the eGold Special Purpose Trust. And termination is exchange for collateral. So if anyone would pay you with the um, <clears throat> eagle, you could have exchanged it for the actual gold.
there was another similar project called Gold Age, uh, because they learned from Eagle that they had always troubles with the authorities, they decided to register uh, the exchange in Panama. But they were also closed down by the United States authorities. And so was the Liberty Reserve. Panama didn't work, so they tried Costa Rica. <clears throat> uh, they, they were organizing an electronic money system without a license. It was very confidential, so people could have used it for, say, hiding some of their earnings or money laundering. But in 2013, it was again closed. Eboolean is a similar system, but uh, maybe even more uh, shady. It was also registered in Panama. It had a lot of users, around 1 million, and uh, they had <coughs> the gold um, collateral. They also offered the first debit card for virtual currencies. But in the end, uh, in 2008, one of the co-founders, uh, co Pamela Fyatt, was murdered by her husband, the other co-founder. So he let her killed by a murderer, by an assassin. And the uh, US government then seized all the assets of the company and sentenced Jim to death. Uh, the clients of Ebullion got some money back. They were partially reimbursed by the US government, but not, uh, not in full. The learning here is that uh, the flaw or flaws of the centralized systems are that they are vulnerable. You have you are dependent on um, a central party, and the central party either could be corrupted, like here in Ebullion, or it can be uh, put away by a government authority. So that's why uh, centralized systems are vulnerable. Another centralized system was QQ Tencent. Have you ever heard about it? This was a successful project. Yes, Tencent is a Chinese messenger. Perfect. It is something like Skype or WhatsApp or something like that. And uh, they also had a currency, a virtual currency that was used in that Tencent. I believe that it is the greatest story never, to, never told in terms of currencies, maybe next to the uh, Virgil and Vara German-Austrian projects. It had more than billion users in more than 80 countries, which means that this QQ currency is by far the biggest uh, company in the world. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest uh, private currency in the world or non-fiat currency in the world, way bigger than Bitcoin uh, or other alternative currencies. How did it work? In the Tencent, which is like a normal messenger, uh, you could have bought avatars with penguins for this QQ coin. QQ is just an abbreviation of cute, cute, because it was meant to be cute. Um, now, <clears throat> you could, uh, apart from buying the avatar, you could have done one more thing with the QQ coin, and that is transferring it to other people, to other users of the Tencent Messenger. People soon realize that they can use it as money. They can pay for other virtual goods or virtual services with it. And uh, as smartphones got more or spread it throughout the population, they started paying with it even in the normal life, even for physical real things in the real life. If you've ever been to China or if you're Chinese, you know that Chinese prefer payment with their cell phone uh, for, for any other type of payment. 
most of their purchases is done through WeChat. Tencent now is the owner of WeChat, and WeChat Pay was replaced or, or replaced uh, the QQ Tencent. Today, when people pay with WeChat, they don't use the QQ coin anymore. Uh, like 10 years ago, uh, the People's Bank of China, their central bank, uh, entered the scheme, joined, joined it. Uh, now Tencent is partially, of course, controlled by the Chinese government, as every big Chinese uh, company. Uh, the party always has a member in, in the board, like supervising what they're doing. So. Uh, it was, um, let's say, taken over by by the government. Uh, and uh, now, when you pay when WeChat, you use normal uh, renminbi, normal Chinese uh, currency. Tencent uh, or QQ Tencent still exists, but it's not that popular uh, anymore. Tencent is a very very big company. It's the sixth biggest internet company in the world. Could you name the first five, by the way? What are the five biggest internet companies? Amazon. Yes, Amazon comes first, and Alphabet or Google, that's the same thing, yes. Facebook. Good. Two more. Alibaba. Perfect. And the last one already mentioned today. And the last one is eBay. Alibaba and Tencent are Chinese. Let's classify QQ Tencent. Uh, the substance is arbitrary. Uh, Monetary Authority is the Tencent company. Carrier electronic account, Monetary Unit is called QCoin. Transmission system is the messenger, uh, institutions, Tencent and Bank of Ch People's Bank of China. There's a mistake here. Bank of China is a commercial bank. Uh, what I mean is People's Bank of China. Uh, collateral is the service because you can always buy the picture of the pink win for a fixed price. So it is the collateral. It's not much, but at least there's some. Creation is discretionary issue and termination exchange for collateral. Otherwise, it just stays there forever. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of Second Life? Second Life is a game in, in virtual reality. You can also play it on a normal computer without without the goggles. <clears throat> and uh, it's yeah, what it says. It, if you don't like your normal life, you can live a second life in a computer game. Uh, and you can do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, there is a currency in there called the Linden Dollar, which is convertible to the US dollar. Uh, well, hmm, unlike some other games in virtual reality, uh, Second Life is more commercial oriented let's say the point in the game was to buy uh, properties like land and uh, put there your banners with advertisement commercials uh, so it's like a promotion space uh, and yeah you can then rent your spaces or uh, money in any way that you can imagine uh, of course you can go fishing hunting it, it is a game and you, you can earn money there. So if you feel like playing computer games is like it's just wasting wasting your time, in games like this, you can earn some money. Today, we have cryptocurrency-based alternatives with cryptocurrencies instead of um, virtual currencies, which is more secure for the user, for the player, because nobody can... Uh, steal your money, or like, I'm sorry, it can happen in the in the virtual schemes in the virtual games. Uh, examples would be Decentraland with their currency called Mana, or Somnium Space, uh, which is based on Ethereum blockchain. 
these projects are getting more and more popular also uh, because of the quarantine and new ways of communication that we have to get used to. Then, you've probably never heard about Venn. It was an exchangeable convertible virtual currency uh, run by Hub Culture. Hub Culture, again, probably you've never heard about it. It's a social network similar to the Let's systems uh, that we spoke about last time. It's like the community, uh, communities with their own currencies uh, that try to exchange mutual favors. So you, you can contribute with what you can, what you can do to, to your peers and vice versa, blah, 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 Hub Culture. Not really important. What I find interesting is this uh, quote. The value of Venn is determined on the financial markets from a basket of currencies, commodities, and carbon futures. And at the same time, it trades against other major currencies at floating exchange rates. And the pricing is provided by Thomson Riders. Now tell me, how do you imagine the price is set? In the first paragraph, you read that there is some way how to determine the price on the financial markets from a basket of currencies, commodities, and carbon futures. So what does it mean? Well, at the same time, it trades against major currencies at floating exchange rates, which means that the price is determined by supply and demand. Yeah, as, the, as Mitri suggests, by demand, yes. But what does it have to do then with the basket of these other assets. The point is that it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really make sense. This just sounds that there is some value of then, and uh, I think it's provided by Thomson Reuters, which is a trustworthy media agency, or news agency. So uh, yeah, it is trustworthy. So we just suggest that the price is this, and you should believe it, and then, because people really believe it, uh, the price is floating around this uh, suggested price level. It's a game. It's like a mind game. And uh, it can be very well explained by this um, trope from Game of Thrones. This is one of my favorite scenes in Game of Thrones. Uh, Lord Barrys meets him in the throne hall and uh, Lord Varys explains to uh, Tyrion Lannister how a resides where man believe it resides. It's a trick. A shadow on the wall and a very small man can cast a very large shadow. This is an answer to a question or to, to let's say a puzzle. You've got a room and you lock Four men in the room. There's a king, there's an archbishop, and also uh, there is a wealthy merchant. And then there is an ordinary mercenary with a sword. The question is who of these four men has the power? Who of these men has the power? Well, you might suggest it would be the guy with the sword because he's got a gun, the others don't have anything to defend. But it's not really true, is it? Because the gun is the only thing the poor guy has. The king can uh, make him a nobleman. The, uh, the merchant can make him wealthy. And the bishop can give him salvation, a star way to heaven. And what will he choose? You never know. You never know. Because it's always a trick, a shadow on the wall. In the previous story, it's the Thomson Reuters that casts the shadow. So it's a charade. Punchlines. Question. What were the problems of virtual currencies possibly resolved by cryptocurrencies? Yes, Rostislav, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, the decentralization, uh, just yeah, so that the centralized systems can be either regulated by the government or can be corrupted. 
mm -hmm. as you said. Yes, perfect. That's it. Also, uh, Dmitry suggests double spending. Well, double spending is the issue that is normally solved by the central party. That's why there are the central parties to avoid uh, people from tempering the database, from spending the same money again. So there must be somebody in charge, somebody uh, to check that uh, money is not spent, being spent twice. Uh, due to the blockchain idea, you can get rid of these middlemen. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Other punchline. Money is a shadow on a wall. Its value is hyper-realistic. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. As long as people believe that there is value in the currency, then it really has the value because other people will accept it. You can buy things with it. But it's all based on the belief. Money is a belief system. Every currency is just a belief system. And it doesn't really matter so much whether there is collateral or not. Even if you have a currency which is based on gold, or even if you have a commodity currency like the cows, the real value is hidden in the fact that people believe that the cows or the gold will be accepted. It is a shared common trick that we used to communicate. Any questions? We are in the middle, so we will start with the uh, in-game currencies. Is there anything you want to ask? Anything about virtual currencies before we proceed to the next topic? Nothing. Okay. Dimitri asks, uh, your wallet on Steam. This is a virtual currency also. Uh, the Steam... You mean Steam like S-T-E-A-M? Like the, the gaming platform? Yes, Steam. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that is a... I, I think that uh, it's an electronic it's an electronic currency because it is uh, in US dollars, isn't it? So if you have a uh, deposit, let's say, on Steam, it, it is dollars, so it is electronic money, I believe, mm -hmm. or euros. So it is not a virtual currency. But it is a good question. A virtual currency uses a different, let's say, um, unit. Uh, it's like independent, uh, or at least potentially independent on the, um, on the fiat currency. I know that sometimes the, the distinction is mm, quite difficult because it's pretty much the same. Uh, but the, there's a legal difference that uh, for uh, issuing electronic currency, you need a, to have a license uh, for, for providing mon money, money services. Uh, we can't exchange it back. Um, and you can't send it to other people. Yeah, so it's like a prepaid credit. Um, it's like a prepaid credit. Depends. Maybe you can say it is a virtual currency. Maybe you can say that it's a virtual currency. It's, it's a prepaid credit. It's like the prepaid voucher, more or less. But um, it is in, in money, you not know, in the games. So, well. Yeah. <clears throat> it's good to think about it, and, and I'm glad that you asked. Uh, well, if you can advocate uh, what what you believe, um, then it's it's fine. At least for me, it's fine. So I would say it's rather a prepaid credit. So, but 
well, yeah, you can say it. It, it is a virtual currency, but not that useful. But okay, it's 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 like the loyalty point, something like the loyalty point. So yes, why not virtual currency, prepaid credit? Yes. <clears throat> this is just a reminder of how the currency specification works. Um, we won't waste time with it uh, today because we are running out of it. We only have one week left and I want to finish the in-game currencies today. Um, definitely, it's time to start working on your paper. Um, I remind you, if you want to go to the exam, you have to send me the paper at least seven days, one week before the date of your exam. Uh, otherwise, you cannot do the exam. Uh, so uh, I had to cancel the application of three people who applied for today because they just didn't uh, insert the their paper into INSYS on time. Yeah. So I will be completely strict about it. If you want to take the exam, you have to send me your paper, insert it into INSYS, just like the instruction says, at least uh, seven days before the date of your exam. Uh, even if your exam will be in a month or something, I think that you should start working on it now because you need to have some practical experience with the money you write about. It's always better and it's always my first question. Do you have a personal experience with it? I mean, during the oral exam, I always ask you whether you, you play with it or not. And there's a lot of value added if you have the personal uh, experience with it. Economic models. Games are economic models, or some of them at least. Paul Krugman, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, said, you should never trust an aviation engineer who refuses to play with models, and you should never trust an economist, theoretician, who is not willing to experiment with the economic models. <clears throat> the original uh, economists or the first generation of economists like David Smith and Ricardo, they tried to build um, castles in the sky like economic models that they never tested in reality. They refused to do the reality check. They just built something theoretical and then they theorized about it uh, no matter what the reality was. And this disease in economics as a science uh, survived until the present day. Still, experiment is something very unusual in economics. And still, the mainstream neoclassical school uh, is uh, uh, building uh, their models on unrealistic assumptions like um, homo economicus and rational, rational expectations and stuff like that. The first economists who tried to test their models were utopian socialists in the 19th century, like Thomas More, uh, Henri de Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier, Robert Owen, uh, probably being the most famous ones. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, Owen was a, a wealthy man, a, a business person, and he started communities, utopian socialist communities with cooperative banks or exchange banks. Um, <clears throat> in these communities, a producer would take their product to the bank and exchange it for a script for money. Now, the value of the script was given by the material cost and hours needed to make the product. And the owner of the script, if you have the money, you can exchange it for another product in the bank. And again, I repeat that the value of what you sell to the bank, you, you are selling to a bank, to an impersonal bank, not to a buyer. Yeah, You just bring it to the store and you get paid based on your costs and the time that you spend with it. How would you think 
the system worked. What was the result of these settings? Collapse, because the producers made the goods overvalued. Yes, definitely, it collapsed. And um, they made it overvalued. Well, of course, because they spent a lot of time doing it. Why would they uh, speed it up? Why would they try to haste? No, they would be extremely lazy. They, it motivated the people to be as slow as possible because the longer it took to produce something, the more money you would get for it. So it is the contrary to any e efficiency. Yeah. Uh, capitalism tries to make people be efficient, sometimes even too much. But this system is the opposite. It prefers laziness, which is stupid. That's one of the mistakes. Are there any other mistakes? There is no price discovery, which means that everyone would want to buy useful things. At the same time, everyone would like to produce things that are easy or funny to produce. Which means that there would always be um, scarcity or shortage on useful products, which it is boring or difficult to produce, and uh, unuseful products would be piling up accumulating in the bank. Price discovery, the price me mechanism in capitalism is designed to solve this issue. People who produce useful things will be motivated by the reward. But here there is no price discovery, there is no supply and demand affecting the price, the price is just determined based on the costs and the time of producing. So. There is no way how to uh, supply the market with useful products. So it was a stupid idea and a stupid experiment that never worked. It was only possible to sustain the community for uh, some time because there was an influx of money from outside of the system, from Robert Darwin uh, himself, who sponsored the whole scheme, and also uh, they introduced terror because people didn't want to, to work. It, it didn't work. So there was a police uh, police force that forced people to produce what the government believed or the, let's say, the director of the community believed it is important to produce. So maybe the idea in the beginning, as always is the case in socialism, was, was nice. Uh, but... <laughs> It didn't work, so it was replaced by coercion and terror. But there was a good thing about socialism, because it enforced four hours working shifts. And thanks to that, people learned that there is something called free time, leisure time. They have more time and they could play games. And games teach us about economy. Most of you, I believe, or all of you, know this game, Monopoly. Do you also know that the game of Monopoly was invented as an economic model? And the point of Monopoly was to teach people that capitalism doesn't work because it makes the rich richer and it makes the poor suffer. Uh, if you are on the loser's side in Monopoly, you probably hate the game and you probably hate the winners because it creates a lot of emotions and uh, that's exactly what the game was supposed to teach you. In Monopoly, there is an impersonal bank. One player is in charge of the bank, but he or she is not the monetary authority because uh, they just do what the rules say. Uh, so if you pay a penalty, it goes to the bank. If you buy a house or a hotel, the money goes to the bank. If you walk around the game board, you receive $4,000 from the bank. In reality, there is nothing like the impersonal bank. 
A bank is always a person. It is always an entity that has their free will. There is nothing like the free bank that would work according to the rules. Blockchain protocols are close to that. They are close. They are the closest things to a rule book. That's why uh, that is the substance called protocol. That um, it, it basically means that the system is organized by some rules that everybody knows in advance, and there is no no uh, deliberation of authorities. You gain money from the impersonal bank when you're successful in terms of real economy. So if you make profit, if you survive in the game and walk around the board, you get new money. So you are rewarded for being successful, for creating profit. In reality, there is nothing like that. Profit does not create new money. When you make profit, you make money, but no money is created. You get money from somebody else. Somebody pays you, but the, the money supply remains unchanged. So it has nothing to do with profit. The monetary authority always is a subject, and uh, money never uh, is issued based on the entrepreneurial success. Profit, again, and this is important, the punchline, profit does not create money in the real world. This is a Czech version of Monopoly. It's called Horse Races and Bets. Is there a difference between Monopoly and Horse Races and Bets? Is anyone familiar with the game? Do you know it? It's a nice game and it's 90% the same like Monopoly. Uh, even the distribution and the prices of the horses is exactly the same like the hotels or, or the houses or the streets. Uh, in, in Monopoly. The only difference here is the bets. It puts a new game mechanic to the game and it puts more risk into the game. Even the loser can win when they are lucky. So here you can make a bet and put your money onto the horse and when you step on it, next to paying the, the entry, the entrance to your opponent, the opponent has to give you 10 times more the money that you bet. Which means that even the loser can win when they are lucky. So the game is not as frustrating. When you're losing, you just take all the money you have, you make a bet on the horse race. It's like the hotel. You need to have the hotels, the horse races. And when you're lucky, you get back to the game. And when you are unlucky, at least you can stop playing and you don't have to suffer as the last loser and to pay everyone and just to pray to end up in the prison. So they took a game that was designed to show the people how frustrating capitalism was. And they made it a little bit less frustrating so that the game is funny. Do you know this game? The cash flow? Yes, Ilya says yes. What is it about? Aha, uh -huh. it is invented by Robert Kiyosaki, uh, a motivational author who wrote a very famous book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. And it's a game on financial management. It teaches you how to use an opportunity and achieve a passive income, which is the ultimate goal of the game, to escape the red race when you have to actively uh, earn money. But the game is microeconomy. It explains how to earn money, not how money works. It doesn't tell you how the whole monetary system works. It just teaches you how uh, you can survive and prosper. My question here is, can everybody be rich? If everyone played cash flow and read the books of Kiyosaki, by Kiyosaki, um, would everyone be rich? What do you think? Exactly, no, everybody would do the same. So in the end, it would just be a positional arms race. That is a concept that I already explained to you twice. Uh, so you, earn money when somebody else loses money. It's a zero-sum game to some extent. Of course, 
uh, the world would be better off because there would be more entrepreneurs and they would bring new ideas and they would use their energy and time uh, to do something productive. So probably uh, people would be a little bit richer, but still money would be redistributed from the losers to the winners again. So it just teaches you how to step on other people's uh, hats. I'm not saying that it is a bad approach. It maybe it's the best approach that we have, but still it doesn't tell you anything about how macroeconomy can work. This is a Czech game, Economica, which was uh, designed uh, to teach students of economics or general public about uh, macro. But even in this game, money is something external. It is not uh, an internal concept. It comes to, into the game on the basis of profit and credit. In reality, money enters economy uh, by credit, but not on profit, as I told you. So here in the game, you have the impersonal bank again. And when you make credit, when, when you make profit, new money enters the game, which I think is a very huge flaw because it is uh, a misconception. And the games like this should debunk. Uh, the preconceived ideas that are false rather than to to support them. Marketix was a game designed by a student of our university, the University of Economics, Andrzej Wojta. It was a com multiplayer uh, online computer game. And the game should have explained how capitalism works. The, ga uh, the aim here, the goal here, again, was to be a successful entrepreneur. Every player started as a worker. The goal was to become an entrepreneur, to start a firm, and to be the competition. Problem was that the uh, game had a demand problem. Workers only consumed food and medicine, and their demand was limited because, well, like it is in reality, uh, you don't consume. Maybe sometimes you consume more food or more medicine than you should, but not too much more because you just physically cannot eat it, you cannot consume it. Uh, so there, were not, there, there was a small variety of stuff that you could have bought as a consumer. There was food, there was medicine, possibly also books, computers for faster learning. Uh, you could have used learning to improve your productivity uh, and to become a better uh, asset, better factor of production, so that the entrepreneurs would prefer you, they would hire you. Uh, all the other goods in the game uh, were produced just as means of production, uh, so it was capital goods, there was a huge variety of capital goods. It was easy to satisfy the demand of workers that was limited, so the production was self-obsessed. It was a Ponzi scheme. In reality, the ultimate goal of ev the ultimate goal of every production is the demand. But here, the demand was unsatisfactory. So, uh, the business people cheated. It was not fun to be a worker in the business central game. Uh, to keep the scheme going, it was needed to find more workers, to keep them being workers. Uh, as the business people cheated, they started registering multi-accounts. They created fake accounts, uh, fake workers, and then they would employ them in their own uh, businesses. The developer of the game tried to fight the multi-accounts in the beginning. Uh, so they banned, he banned the uh, multi-accounts and stuff, but later he resigned and legalized it. And he also legalized gambling for the real players. The, there was a new, project, uh, new product, um, a lottery ticket, and the workers could bet their money uh, the money that they earned by working, and they could have hope to win a lottery and to have enough money to start a business. So the game uh, became basically a parable 
of the society in Hunger Games. You you suffer uh, uh, unless you get lucky, and then you can escape uh, the, the worker position and to become someone better, an entrepreneur. The scary thing here is that it was a result of nobody's wickedness or tyranny. It was a logical outcome of a poorly designed free market. The other issue was money. Workers came into the game with zero money, and the only way to earn money was by working. Money flew out of the system by paying taxes then. The only inflow was by working for firms owned by the developer of the game himself. So it resembled the money in socialist economies where uh, wages were the only source of money. Here, there were other employers next to the government, but only uh, the government created new money and paid it to the workers. So once again, there was an external bank, but now it was uh, controlled deliberately by a godlike person. The state-owned firms paid unreasonable wages in order to uh, oppose or to protect from deflation. So uh, there was huge wages in state-owned firms and small wages uh, in the privately owned firms. And these unreasonable wages de 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 uh, damaged the real firms that had to compete each other. Voita, the author of the games, insisted that all money must be earned, and for sustaining this dogma, he let the game collapse. Yet in the end of the day, it served as an economic model par excellence. Starcraft. Uh, in this game, uh, there is a very simple economy. Money is just one of the resources uh, that you can dig out of the ground. It comes from uh, the crystals. So it's just like gold coming from the mines. Like in Warcraft, the older game uh, by Blizzard. Age of Empires 2. Here, the same concept is being used. Money is just gold. It comes from the mines. But there are other sources of money. Uh, you can find relics, put them into the church, and that slowly creates some money, uh, which represents tourism. Uh, also, trade produced some gold. So uh, it taught you about the fact that trading uh, makes some wealth. So if you bought this, um, I don't know, trading station or market, uh, you could have produced ox uh, wagons and send it to other uh, markets and that produced some gold. Of uh, also, in these markets, you could have exchanged other resources like wood or stone into gold. So it was there was more uh, more reality and more complexity, but still, it didn't really um, serve as a good model of an economy. In Age of Empires three, uh, the economy is a little bit better. Uh, there is not that much micromanagement, and there are other sources of income. Uh, like you can build plantations uh, that produce uh, money directly, but still, uh, it has nothing to do with reality. Tropicon. Are you familiar with this game? Have you ever played Tropicon? Yes, I did. What is it about? Um, well, you are basically a dictator, let's say in Cuba or in like in this Caribbean, like on an, on an island and you build houses and uh, produce something uh, like uh, sugar or whatever. And then you, then you trade basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in Tropico, the player represents a president or a dictator in a Spanish speaking banana republic or island republic. And the uh, player uh, controls the whole economy, including setting up prices, determining what shall be produced, who produces it, who marries whom, where people will uh, live, foreign policy, everything, everything but money. 
money can only get to the island from abroad. So it's extremely uh, extrinsic. It comes from export and tourists uh, from the United States or Soviet Union. Uh, these countries, the United States and Soviet Union, can also send you new money as a development aid. Uh, if your economy is closed up, let's say autarkic, it cannot be a monetary economy. Here, uh, there is no money. And in the first campaign in Tropical 3, there's a plane crash, like in Lost, uh, the, the TV show. Uh, there is very restricted contact with the outside world, so there is not really much money in it, uh, which is extremely weird, because no money, no funny. <laughs> so the game introduces you to the specific issue it is suffering from. The best economic game, I believe, is Sid Meier's Civilization. It is considered to be the best game of all times. So it uh, frequently wins awards uh, for, for best rated games, and it's purely a macroeconomic game. There is no lord over the player. There is no impersonal bank. The player himself is the impersonal bank. Player is not designed for making more money in civilization. There are several victory conditions, and accumulating money is none of them. Money only explains the economy. It is a tool. The player does not control the population entirely here. He or she only sets the policies. Uh, they stimulate the population to concentrate, focus on certain activities. Money has two natures in the game of civilization and in reality. The stock nation or nature and uh, stock fl uh, and flows nature. Flows represent economic activity for one turn, and stocks is for the exchequer, for the government or state treasury. Uh, so if you save money, if you save part of the flows and not spend it in the economy, you can pile up some savings and then use it for buying things from abroad or uh, speeding up some production. In some older versions of the game, flows of money are symbolized by arrows. arrows. Uh, so they picture the quantification of trade, which is very realistic. Diablo. <clears throat> in Diablo, uh, at least in the free uh, Diablo 1 and 2, uh, merchants have unlimited money, and that even applies to Diablo 3, which I'm playing right now. At the, not right now, but I play it uh, now, like today evening. Uh, merchants here have unlimited money, and you can buy things there. Uh, when you buy something at a merchant, the money escapes from the economy, it leaves it. It's money destruction channel. And uh, if you sell something to the merchants, they give you money from the impersonal bank and that's how it enters the economy. Also, you can kill monsters and they drop money or objects that can be uh, sold. So the substance here is protocol because there is a code in the game uh, that tells you how it operates. So there is no real monetary authority. Carrier is in-game pouches with money and the monetary unit is gold. Uh, in Diablo 3 there are no pouches anymore, but it's it's the same thing. And the transmission system pretty much is the vendor's interface. In Diablo 3, uh, which is more multiplayer uh, concerned, there are other channels, but uh, in, the, in the primitive version or in the uh, older version, money is just for, you know, trading with, with the merchants, with the vendors who are the institutions and uh, we can say that there is no collateral or we can say that every object or, or every asset every weapon uh, is a collateral because there are fixed prices by uh, vendors a creation is by grinding meaning that you play the game over and over again and you are earning money uh, by killing monsters so that's the creation and termination is buying things 
Have anyone played Gothic? I really loved Gothic, not because not just because it is a good game and it has beautiful atmosphere uh, and storyline, but also because it depicts uh, a beautiful example of a greatly designed currency. In the game, there is a mining colony inhabited by convicts, by criminals. Uh, the prisoners mine magic ore. The ore is not scarce in the colony, but it is scarce anywhere else. Inside a colony, the ore can be mined by anyone with a pick, with a pickaxe, uh, and it can be consumed for casting spells. The ore is used as money inside the colony. It has intrinsic non-monetary value because uh, you can cast spells using it and then it is consumed. There is unlimited demand for the ore. Even if there was not so much need for magic, the ore can be traded out of the colony, exchanged for supplies, luxuries, prostitutes, etc. It is a perfect money for such a monetary area. It is created by work. It has intrinsic value. It is not inflationary because bigger amounts enable uh, better magic and then it is consumed. So it is balanced. Can something serve as money as good as this ore in our world? Is there something that everyone can produce just by spending their energy and time, something that is uh, easily transferable and that keeps intrinsic value uh, and then when you use it, it, it is consumed? Is there anything like that? It's a little bit difficult, this question, but I think that potentially, yes. Donor plasma, donor plasma, th this is an original idea, I've never heard that. Uh, but it's amazing. Yes, <laughs> that's that's really good. Uh, that could work. That's maybe too scarce, I'm afraid. But well, I, I would love to read a term paper on donor plasma as a currency because I think that this idea has potential. Thank you, Ilya. Um, I would say energy. Energy would be something like that. You can create it just by uh, I don't know, riding a bike uh, that is connected to a dynamo uh, or, or produce it in, in, in any um, primitive power plant, for instance. But the problem is that you cannot really store energy. There are batteries, but they are not super efficient. Uh, other idea might be resources like petrol, uh, like gas in the form of vouchers. You remember Vera which was a voucher for coal that was like the magic ore of the 20th century. Perhaps also computational capacity, um, but that is a flow uh, asset. So the money also would need to be designed as flow money instead of stocks money. You, you could not really pile it up. Plasma is interesting. Yeah, this is how the ore works. So you, you just you just take, take a pickaxe and, and mine it, and then you produce money. Uh, last thing that we will discuss today is the movie In Time. Have you seen it? What is money in In Time? It's the time! Yes, exactly. In this movie, it's a sci-fi movie, uh, and you have life for free, until you are 25, you don't even age. Then you have one more year uh, and time, seconds, counts as money. And you lose it, every second you lose one second of your time. Death in this story is not given by nature. Nobody has to die. There is, a, uh, there is enough time for everybody, in fact. There is no impersonal bank designed and controlled by God uh, for which time would flow when somebody earns it. But nobody knows that. And the main character, which is played by Justin Timberlake, and by the way, Justin Timberlake is quite a good actor. I was surprised by it. 
So Justin Timberlake learns that from a guy who gives him 100 years, which is like a fool. And uh, he realizes that fact that they are living in a conspiracy world where uh, authorities, the, the, the rich uh, tycoons, uh, are trying to control people by creating artificial scarcity of time, which literally kills people. The mother of Justin Timberlake dies in the beginning of the movie, which is very sad uh, <clears throat> because she is played by Olivia Wilde, and uh, it's a very sad uh, moment. And then the Timberlake decides to break the system. The guy who gave money to Timberlake asked him what would he do uh, if he had 100 years of time. And Timberlake answers, I would stop counting it. He would stop concentrating most of his thoughts on survival. He would build his own value system. He would get rid of stress and he would do what he himself would find useful. He would free himself. How does the parable relies, relates, how does it relate to our world? That we have to work all the time to get the money, to live one more day, for to get food and stuff. And if we had much, a lot more money, we would, uh, for example, do more of our hobbies and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, very well, very well. And uh, the time here represents, I would say, death, death in our world. Uh, so just like the death in, in time, the death in our world is artificial. The indebtedness is a designed burden. It doesn't have to be that way. The only way how you can create money is by debt, by credit. But it doesn't have to be this way. There are alternatives. That's what I'm trying to teach you all the time. And I'm not saying that the alternatives are 100% better than the debt. I'm just saying now that the indebtedness is absolutely artificial. It is a tool. Maybe it is working. Maybe it's fine. But it is a burden which is added artificially to the system. The film discloses a conspiracy. Similarly to films like Matrix, Fight Club, B for Vendetta, or The Hunger Games already mentioned. But we don't have to believe in conspiracies. It makes no difference whether the so-called sustainable insufficiency is a neo-feudal conspiracy or maybe just a random side effect of a basically soundly designed economic system. In both systems, it contradicts personal freedom. That was the last thought of today. Uh, we will not speak about World of Warcraft or Corabia, which I was a game designer of. Um, that's it. That's it. This is, uh, let's end it with a quotation by Yanis Varoufakis, uh, the former Minister of Finance of Greece over indebted Greece under the Tsipras government, who before he became uh, the uh, finance minister of Greece served as a macroeconomist for Valve, so he designed currencies in uh, um, Team Fortress 2, for instance, and he said that uh, a great thing about being a game designer is that you have all the data. You have all the data and you can make studies. So unlike the most of the economies who hate to experiment because they don't know how to do that, they don't have the relevant data. If you are a macroeconomist in a multiplayer computer game, you have all the data in the world and you can test your ideas without playing with real people's life. Your reading task would be the, the one that I put uh, in the end of the presentation. It's the one from the previous one. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I see on INSYS that there are three free places on today's exam. So may I attend the uh, exam for, for, for today instead of uh, somewhere in June? Uh, yes, yes, you can. Because you already gave me the uh, paper, right? And I already corrected it. 
Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can use this free slot. Yes, I can add you to the list. All right, and, uh, and where the exam will take? Here on the uh, Microsoft Teams? Yes, or? in this place, in this place. So I just uh, after we finish, I will put a meeting here uh, to the calendar, uh, 2 p.m. today, Central European time, and uh, there will be four uh, spaces. All right. Mm -hmm. Th that's yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, it's no, it's no problem. You're welcome. Cool. Fine. Any other question? Uh, yeah, I have one. What about our points for um uh, for our work? Uh, you mean activity points? No, I mean uh, for today exam, our presentation and mm. how to much we are. To be honest, uh, I was on a vacation uh, in the nature with my brother, so I have not yet read uh, your paper. Uh, neither have I read uh, paper by. Uh, well, there, there was one more person. I, I don't remember now, but I will do it before. I, I have three more hours to read it, so I will read it before the exam and you will know the points, of course. I, I have to, because uh, the, the exam is about defending your paper. I have not yet done it, but I will. No, no worries. Okay, thank you. Cool. If there are no other questions, thank you very much for uh, participation today. And next time, uh, in a week, we will have the last uh, lecture together. Hmm? Have a great time. Bye. 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 Bye.